Jesus ought to be the love of our heart. We are certainly the love of his heart. But as happens in life, we get busy, we get distracted, we start to stray from the Lord. Back in 1869, a young man by the name of Timothy Eaton started a department store and it became a huge success and he opened these huge Eaton's department stores across Canada and the Eaton family became probably the wealthiest family in all of Canada. They were so wealthy. However, over the next two generations of family members who inherited the business, they made a series of foolish financial decisions. And in 1999, that's 34 years ago? No, 24 years ago. Anyhow, the whole company went bankrupt. Eaton Company went bankrupt. Isn't that sad? Tell you something else. In the early 1800s, a very clever young man by the name of Cornelius Vanderbilt. He was a very enterprising young man, very clever. He started with nothing, and he built one of the world's largest personal fortunes. And he did it through shipping and through railroads. He became one of the world's wealthiest men. Incredible. But the succeeding generations after him, his sons and his sons' sons, made some incredibly foolish financial decisions and they basically squandered it all away. The Vanderbilt family these days, by and large, they are compar comparatively, they're broke. They have nothing. They just have a name. In life, I think that everyone at some point makes a mistake and they'll make a financial boo-boo and they'll lose money. Personally, I've made several financial disasters, decisions that have come back to haunt me, and I've paid dearly for them over the years. But I would think that, generally speaking, most people hope that they have a financially secure life. I know there's a lot of young people, they grow up and they're going into college and university with the idea of becoming really wealthy and having that corner office and having all of the toys and everything. But you know, it doesn't always happen, does it? A lot of men and women have given years and years of their lives to earn doctorates. And they have nothing to show except a lot of student debt. And they're working normal jobs in restaurants and taxis things like that. Am I going again? Is my voice going? Amplifier? All right. We're just going to have to limp through today and we'll get it fixed for you tonight. I promise. By the way, Pastor Silver's preaching tonight and I saw his message and it's all about the good life of King Hezekiah and the things we can learn. So if you've made a decision to come to only one church service, you've made the wrong decision. You should have come tonight. Tonight is where you're going to get blessed. So I want to encourage you to come tonight to the evening service tonight at 6 o'clock and you will be blessed. Anyhow, getting back to our message today, most people, I think, I haven't yet met one who wants to be a disaster. No one that I know of wants to to have a disastrous life that I know of. And yet so many people do. So many people end up going broke. And this is what I want to get at tonight, today, this morning. The financial woes that some people experience for many years. Why does that happen and what can we do to fix it? Going broke means you're experiencing financial shipwreck. It means you don't have enough money to pay, or money or cash flow, to pay your expenses. Going broke means that sometimes you're purposely not paying certain bills 
in order to buy you some time. Going broke means that you're trying to borrow money from friends or credit cards or line of credit or something in order to keep your nose above water and keep bills paid. Going broke means you're caught in a downward spiral, a financial spiral. You're out of control and you're headed for bankruptcy. And going broke happens to people who make normal incomes and it happens to people who make hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in their paychecks. They go broke too. Two years ago, the CTV News here in Canada did a study and found that one half of all Canadians are only within $200 of going broke. Now that kind of is scary. In the last two years, Canada has experienced its highest ever level of businesses going bankrupt. The thing about going broke is that it doesn't affect just you. It'll affect people around you. When I was preaching in Saskatchewan, one of the pastors took me for a little tour around the countryside, around his church, and he pointed out a paper mill. And it was a huge paper mill. And I said, what's happening there? And he says, nothing. They had railroad tracks going in with the weeds all growing up through the railroad tracks. I said, what's the story here? He told me that it, was, it used to be a very prosperous paper mill, but they, they closed down many years ago. I asked why. He told me it's because of some underhanded practices by the employees. The employees were doing things that was costing the company way too much money. They wouldn't stop. And so the company closed its doors. And just like that, 1,500 people were out of work. Just like that. That's 1,500 family incomes that aren't coming home anymore. Isn't that something? That wasn't all. There were dozens and dozens of local businesses that supplied important services, valuable services to this paper mill. Now they had no more work. All that was lost. Many of the newly unemployed people had to move away in order to find employment. And that affected the local economy. Local businesses such as grocery stores, corner stores, gas stations, etc. They all suffered. The bankruptcy of that one company or the going broke of that one company affected a lot of people. Putting it into more local terms, if say a a happily employed father were to go broke, it puts huge pressure on the mother and on the children and they may have to make some drastic changes in their lifestyle. They may have to even move far away to find work. However, something is kind of curious to me and that is some people have been broke for a long time and it's become a way of life. That sounds a little curious to me, but it's true. Perhaps these people do make a small income, but they find that even though as careful as they can be, their basic needs seem to eat up all of their income and they're basically living hand to mouth. It's like living broke. It's been this way for so long, they seem to just kind of give up and live with it. But I ask you, is that any way to live? Where is the power of God Throughout history, untold millions of people have gone broke as a result of things out of their control, such as war, such as hyperinflation, such as disease, such as COVID. But aside from this sort of thing, many people have gone broke, listen carefully, through a series of financial mistakes. That is the most common way for people to go broke. And so it's this that I want to look at for the next little while this morning as we consider the subject, how to go broke and how to fix it. So would you join me in prayer and let's ask God to teach us today. Heavenly Father, you have all of the answers. We have all of the problems. Please educate us today. I pray for anyone today who may be suffering some severe financial trauma or stress 
that you would give them heaven-sent wisdom, that you would give them some encouragement and maybe a little miracle or two. Our Father, speak with our hearts today. The bottom line, help us to follow you better, to live more for you, and show yourself strong in our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, an important Bible principle, and it's mentioned two times in the book of Proverbs. In chapter 14 and chapter 16, you will find exactly these same words. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, in financial terms, this means that when people make financial decisions... Sometimes it just seems like the right thing to do. Oh boy, honey, it's going to be payday for us. Man, a living. We're going we're gonna to bring home the bacon this time because of this decision I've made. Only to find out down the road a few days, a few months, what a disaster. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And this applies to finances. Every one of us here today has some kind of finances. You might think, well, I've got nothing. No, you have something. You maybe have very little, but you have something. But I'll tell you what, you have something even more important. You have the power of Almighty God waiting there to help you. Keep that in mind. That's very important. In simplistic terms... There are two basic or main or major causes why people go broke. There are two. So I'm going to give you this sermon in two point forms. Point number one is what are these two main causes of going broke? Point number two is how do we fix it? So here's point number one. What are the two main causes of going broke? Well, number one, of course, is foolish financial decisions. Now, if you have your Bible open in Luke chapter 15, we just read those verses a few minutes ago. Brother Howard was kind and gracious to lead us in the scripture reading today. We have the story of what we call the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. The Lord Jesus gave this parable essentially to teach coming back to God. People who've strayed away from God come back to God. Don't delay Life is not meant to be lived apart from God. God is our maker. He's our designer. He's the lover of our souls. God loved us so much that he left heaven, came to earth, and he died for us on the cross, shedding his blood. You say, what does that mean? It means the sin, the wrongdoing in our lives has to be paid for. It has, someone's got to pay for it. We can either pay for it ourselves in a place called hell after we die, Or, God says, I'll pay it. And on the cross, his name is Jesus, and on the cross he died for our transgressions, our sins, our iniquities. Every creepy thing we've ever done, every bad thought, every unkind word, everything that would be wrong in the sight of God, and we've done it, Jesus paid for it. But now you've got a payment, and now you've got us. And it's when we receive that payment That's when we get our sins forgiven. That's when we can really tap into the power of God. That's when we have a home in heaven. It's important that every man, woman, and young person receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Because after we die, there's no second chance. You're not going to come back again. It's not going to work. It doesn't happen. We have this life only. You say, how do we know? Because God tells us in the Bible, that's why. Anyhow, Back to the sermon here today. We have a young man um, in verse 12 saying to his father that he wants the inheritance. And so his father gave it to him. And then verse 13, the boy takes off. How old the boy was, we don't know. I don't think he was 10 or 12. I think he was probably, you know, in his 20s or something. Only my opinion only. But he takes off into a far country. It says in verse 13, And there wasted his substance with riotous living. 
And I am sure that the young boy at the time thought, this is great, this is wonderful. I am fulfilling all my heart's desires. I got all this money still. What could possibly go wrong? You see, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And in reality, what happened was one day he woke up and it was all gone. He had spent it. Maybe some of it was robbed from him. That can happen. There's stories of uh, prostitutes who drug their, their, they call them Johns, right? The guy who goes after the prostitute. They, they drug their, their John and then the, the guy wakes up the next day and he's been robbed. Everything's gone and so is the prostitute. So maybe that's what happened to him as well. But it was certainly a foolish financial decision, wasn't it? Because it affected his finances. Back in the 1500s, there was a man by the name of Thomas Tusser. T-U-S-S-E-R. Tusser, it's an unusual last name. But he was an English poet. And he wrote a book about properly managing a farm. And he coined a phrase in his book that has since gone around the world. It's become a world famous phrase. Here was what Thomas Tusser said. A fool and his money are soon parted. A fool and his money are soon parted. Boy, that phrase grew legs and ran around the world. Everyone, everywhere seems to have some version of that. Uh, in, in, In other words, the idea of what he was saying is that foolish people will spend their money recklessly and will end up losing it all. Whereas wise people... Well, they make more careful decisions with their money and they tend to preserve their wealth. The basic principles of maintaining good finance are all based on sound reason. And they've been around for thousands of years. It's nothing new. But it's when you and I start acting foolishly and when we start making major decisions without consulting God, that's a foolish thing. We usually suffer for it. The young prodigal in Luke 15 was really a fool and his money. I went to a website called The Penny Hoarder. The Penny Hoarder. And they gave four ways to go broke. Number one, live beyond your means. Number two, make bad investments. Number three, don't have a budget. Number four, burn up money on credit card interest. There's a lot of truth to what they tell us. I'd like to add a number five in there. Small loans from payday loan companies. That, believe it or not, is a financial trap. You say, why? What's the big problem with payday loans? It's their interest rate. The interest rate they charge. Exceptionally high. People with healthy finance do not use payday loan companies. It's only desperate people who go to payday loan companies. Those are the only ones. That's their customer base. The government of Canada has a website that warns Canadians against using payday loan companies. They point out the severe cost they'll pay by using payday loan companies. They give an example of a 14-day loan for $300. Using a credit card, it'll cost about $8 in interest. But using payday loan companies, it'll cost $51 in interest. The maximum allowable by law, the maximum allowable interest rate in Canada, do you know what it is? Now, if you're a financial person, you probably already know this. But if you're not an accountant or a tax wizard, do you know what it is? You know, your credit card is 19%, 18%. What is the maximum by law allowable percentage rate in Canada? Would you believe 60%? That's what it says on the government website. 60%. A fool and his money. Foolish financial decisions. Now just for fun, I went online and I went to an online artificial intelligence program. AI. I said, hi. It said, hi back. I asked it this question. What are the most common ways that people lose all their money? That was my question to artificial intelligence. Here's what artificial intelligence told me. There were eight ways. Number one, gambling. That one I knew. It went on and it said, betting on games or other events can lead to devastating financial losses. 
That's AI telling me. Number two, investing in risky ventures. Some people, and it goes, I'm telling you what it says to me. Some people plunge into risky investments hoping to make big profits. While it may work for some, many others end up losing all their money. Number three, poor financial planning. Failing to budget, overspending, or taking on too much debt can lead to financial ruin. Folks, this is a computer program telling us this. Number four, and I, I didn't think of this one, number four, divorce. Maybe you knew this, but divorce proceedings, including legal expenses, asset division, spousal support, can wipe out a person's savings. Number five, medical expenses. Unexpected medical bills can quickly drain a person's bank account. Number six, fraud or scams. Falling victim to fraudulent schemes can result in irreversible financial losses. In the United States, $29 billion are lost annually through these telephone scams and frauds. That's scary. Number seven, poor money management skills. When people lack financial literacy, they are unable to make informed decisions about their finances and often spend lavishly, leading to bankruptcy. And number eight, and this is another one that I didn't realize. So there was two of them here that I didn't realize. Divorce and this one, number eight. Lifestyle inflation. You say, what's that? As individuals earn more income, so their paycheck goes way up, it tempts them to upgrade their lifestyle drastically, which is unsustainable, and they end up losing their money. The young man here in chapter 15 of Luke, the young prodigal, was a fool and his money. He made incredible, lousy financial decisions. He started really with quite a lump sum of money, an incredible inheritance, and he blew it. Okay, I said this sermon is in two points. Point number one is the foolish financial decisions. Uh, actually, I said point number one, what are the two main causes of going broke? And sub point number one is foolish financial decisions. But here is sub point number two. The hand of God. The hand of God can make you broke. I want you to see this for yourself. I'd like you to turn to the book of Haggai. Now for some people they're saying, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, where's the index? No, no. Go to the book of Matthew in the New Testament. I'll show you how to find Haggai. Go to Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? So go to Matthew. And then you go one page before Matthew and you are in the book of what? Malachi. And then you go two pages back from Malachi and you're in the book of what? Zechariah. And there's 14 chapters. So you go to the beginning of Zechariah and what have you got? Haggai. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Can you say that with me? Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Now, once again, only this time, everyone say it. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. There's Haggai. And in Haggai chapter 1, I'd like you to follow with me. Tell you what, read it with me. Verse 5, 6, and 7. 5, 6, and 7. Haggai chapter 1. Keep your seats. Let's read it out together. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, 
Consider your ways. You say, what's happening here? Whew. Well, God was making the people broke. It was the hand of God. They were doing everything right, but yet still, for some reason, they were coming up empty. And that still happens today in people's lives where they're making good decisions. Things should work. One plus one should equal two. But for some reason, the two's missing. For some reason, the things that should be happening are not happening. And that's what we find here in Haggai chapter 1. And the reason is because those people were leaving God out of their lives. Oh, they were paying lip service to God. But God was not first in their lives the way he should be. That can happen to anyone. It can happen to any Christian sitting in the pew. It can happen to any pastor standing in a pulpit. It can happen to any human being where we get so busy that God gets set to one side. If you remember reading Revelation chapter 2, the letter to the church at Ephesus, it was a great church doing wonderful things, but Jesus said, I have somewhat against thee, thou hast left thy first love which, of course, is Jesus. Jesus ought to be the love of our heart. We are certainly the love of his heart. But as happens in life, we get busy, we get distracted, we start to stray from the Lord. We've left our first love. That's what happened to these people here in the days of Haggai the prophet. They got so busy with their lives and busy making money, that God says, I'm going to have to get your attention. And things started to go south. Things started to go wrong for them. And things that shouldn't go wrong were going wrong. That's what happens. Life is made up of both, both physical things and spiritual things. That is life. Physical and spiritual. We would be foolish to turn a blind eye to God and ignore the spiritual we would be foolish to do that. That's another foolish decision. You know, even if you had a million dollars in the bank, and even if you had no debts at all, your house is paid for, your cottage, your boat, everything is paid, paid for, you've got zero debt, and a million dollars in the bank, you can still go broke. Because God has ways of making you go broke. All he has to do is blow on that little bit and it's gone. And God knows how to do that. But please remember, God is a God of love. He's not a mean old man up on a throne with a big stick seeing whose lives he can annoy. He loves us dearly, desperately because he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into the world to die for us. That's love. That's the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That means to die and go to hell, but have everlasting life. That means to die and go to heaven. That's how much God loves us. God is a God of love. He takes no joy in having to bring judgment into a person's life. But listen carefully. God has established the earth. He's established human life with certain principles. We could call them laws, if you will. Certain principles or laws. And if we violate these principles, if we violate these, these laws of the universe, we will suffer for them. And I'll give you an example. The law of gravity. The law of gravity. It's right there to meet you when you jump off the roof thinking you can fly. The law of gravity will give you a good argument why you can't. And it'll pull you down. You violated the law of gravity. There's, of course, the law of chemical reaction, such as heat and the melting point of human flesh, which happens when you accidentally put your hand on a hot stove element. And you've got a mark there as a reminder. Those are laws that you can't change. Well, I'm just going to jump off my roof and fly. Be my guest. 
I'm just going to put my hand, I'm going to put my face on a hot stove element. <laughs> Your decision. How about the laws of motion and force and energy? How about those laws? Motion and force and energy. You see, they explain the reason why when swinging a hammer and you hit your thumb instead of the nail, the, motion, the laws of motion, force, and energy actually send you to the hospital. <laughs> you can't violate those laws and not suffer for it. When you stand back, though, and you look at the whole thing, it's kind of like the law of the harvest. I think we're all familiar with the law of the harvest. If you sow, you will reap. Some religions of the world today call that karma. Whatever you sow, you will reap. In the Bible, it's known as the law of the harvest. And it's very true. The computer engineers and programmers, they used to say, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. The reason why some families are so busted and broken and destroyed and gone the four, you know, north, south, east, west, the four directions is because of the seed that was sown in the beginning. You reap what you sow. And the Bible tells us, and I'll sort of paraphrase, but, you know, if you abuse your family, you'll inherit the wind. <laughs> That's all you'll get. If you abuse your family, they're going to leave you. They're going to take off. You reap what you sow. These are very important truths. We can't afford to miss them. And God warns us in the Bible of certain actions in life that will bring us to financial ruin. The Bible teaches that God can bring us to financial ruin in order to get our attention. And God does that. And God has done that in my life too with some of those crazy decisions I made years ago. God can even close certain doors that should be open. The boss is leaving. You're the next one in line for the job. Everyone is already patting you on the back. And then some new kid comes and gets the job. What just happened? God closes a door. God doesn't do it because he hates. God does it because he loves. It's just we don't understand it at the time. God can, can make us unexpectedly sick like he did in my life three months ago. God can even take away certain blessings like he did in the life of Job. And Job said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. But then what did Job say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Sometimes we forget that part. He does all this in order to get our attention and, and encourage us in good behavior and teach us things. So, okay, what are some of these invisible principles that God has established that can affect our finances? I'm going to give you a list of five. You can write them down. I'm not going to spend a long time on any one of them. I'll list them for you. There are five of them. I'll give you the, the title. I'll give you the Bible verse. You can look it up later. But I'll read you the Bible verse as well so you'll have the complete list. Number one. The love of money. The love of money. If you have this love of money, love, 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 ooh, got to have the money, love the money, love the money. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It's the love of money. Number two, the love of sleep. The love of sleep will affect you financially. It'll affect your bottom line. Proverbs 20, verse 13. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Something to keep in mind. We all need our proper amount of sleep, but you go beyond that. That's what God is saying. Be careful. Number three. The love of pleasure and wine. The love of pleasure and wine. The prodigal son had that problem, didn't he? Proverbs 21, 17. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. Be careful. 
those things, pleasure, wine, they're all out there. Number four, hoarding money. Hoarding, gathering, piling, heaping, you know, mine, mine, hoarding money. Proverbs 11.24, there is that, there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. That means God does not want us to hoard money. Money is a tool. Money is, can be a wonderful tool, but I tell you, it's a horrible master. Don't ever become a slave to money. You be the master, let the money be the slave. Use money as a tool. But when you hoard money, hoard money, hoard money, it tendeth to poverty. Proverbs eleven twenty four. And number five, and this one's important, withholding payments of legitimate debts. Withholding payments of legitimate debts. That means not paying your bills. Proverbs 3.27 Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. So don't hold back money that belongs to someone else. Okay, that, all that is point number one. How do we go broke? I've just told it to you. Now point number two. How do we fix it? Point number two. How do we fix going broke? Or perhaps this. How do we prevent from going broke? That's another way to look at it. How do we prevent from going broke? In Proverbs 22 verse 3 it says, A prudent man. Now a prudent man is a man who looks twice and steps once. A, man is, a prudent man hears twice and speaks once. A prudent man measures twice and cuts once. You get the idea? A prudent man or a prudent lady might double check. How many cups of sugar? Oh yes. And then go ahead with the recipe. I got a funny story I'll tell you one day about a friend of mine. He was a chef in the Navy and how he threw monster handfuls of salt into the, the pot. I mean, he was cooking for like 500 men or something, but it was another story. Funny, funny story. A prudent man foreseeth the evil. He looks ahead and he sees the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. That's a good verse, Proverbs 22.3. You know, the world of finance is vast. It's complicated. Just ask any accountant. People go to college for years to study the world of finances. And then they spend several more years becoming expert accountants or expert financial advisors. It takes years to really get a good handle on the whole world of, a, of finance. But the good news, folks, is you don't have to be an accountant in order to properly handle your finances. You don't. No more than you have to be a world-class race car driver in order to drive your family to church. You don't have to be a race class, world race class driver. You can learn the principles, the simple principles of handling money. Anyone can. You don't have to be, you know, the world's greatest accountant in order to stave off from going broke. Anyone can learn the basic principles of properly handling money. But let's say this, right at the beginning here. Tell me if you agree with this statement. Fixing things always takes longer than breaking them. Would you agree with that? Generally speaking, it takes longer to fix something than it does to break it. Maybe an example, you break your arm. That only took a second. Pastor Devian, where are you? Our loving, dear Pastor Devian was playing volleyball and in a nanosecond tore his hamstring. We're still praying for him. He's still gingerly walking around. It's been two weeks, three weeks. How many more months have you got? Five months? One, one month. Okay. There's an example how long it took to break, how long it takes to fix. 
right? You can break your finances by going to the casino and in one evening you can lose everything you've got. Everything. In one quick evening. Whew. It could take you years to build back what you once had. Now, I'm, I'm saying this, folks. It can be done. You may be here today and your finances may be all destroyed and twisted. The good news is you can have a good, secure financial life again. Or maybe it's only broken one place. It can be fixed, but it'll take a little time. That's God's way. God's way is always the right way. So, what are these basic rules for fixing broke, brokenness? Did I say that right? Fixing financial brokenness. What, what are the rules? I'm going to give you them. There are five of them. You can write them down. I think they're very important. Rule number one, put God first. Put God first in your life, above everything, above everyone. Put God first. That's the place where God has to be. Second place is no good. Well, I'll put my wife first. I'll put my children first. I'll put my husband first. And then God. I'll put my job first. And then God. You are making a mistake. It's a foolish decision. You have to put God first. Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't do it. You can't keep them equal. You're going to end up loving one and hating the other. That's what's going to happen. I didn't say that. Jesus, God in the flesh said that. You have to put God first. In order for you to be the best husband, the best wife you can be, you have to put God first above everything and everyone. In order to get your finances fixed, you have to put God where he belongs. Numero uno. Number one in your life. Number, rule number two is honor God. Pay respect to God. Honor God with your tithes. Anyone can give God lip service, but when it comes to tithing, oh, that's good. that could cost me some money. <laughs> Listen, that's where your faith comes in. There used to be a very popular bumper sticker. People would put them on their cars many years ago. Honk if you love Jesus. Honk, honk. Honk if you love Jesus. Honk, honk. Someone came up with a better bumper sticker. If you love Jesus, don't honk. Tithe. Put your money where your mouth is. Did you know that God's promise is still true today in Malachi chapter 3? That if we bring the tithes in, God will open the storehouse of his riches in glory. It's still true today. There's a lot of Christian people the world over. They attend church, but they don't tithe. And they've got various reasons for it. But usually, the number one reason is, well, I'm scared. You know, if I give, you know, I, I need that money, I'll go broke. No, 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 you're going broke because you're not tithing. You start tithing and you're going to now bring the power of God into your finances. That's the promise of God. Now listen, this is not one of those ministries where your tithe goes into this pocket right here. There are churches that do that. There are Benny Hins out there that do that to you. This is not a ministry like that. Your tithes go in to keep the lights on, keep the gospel strong in this city. Keep salaries paid for sure, but to keep insurance paid, to keep utilities paid, you know, to keep bills paid and things that we want to do as a church, expenses. That's where your tithe stays. You're benefiting from your tithing right here. It doesn't go into this pocket. So make sure you understand that when you give, you're giving to God. So this rule number two is so very, very important. Tithe. Rule number three. Pray for financial wisdom and seek wise counsel. Pray for financial wisdom and seek wise counsel from godly people that you trust. We have a number of godly, wise, financial people in our church that can help you or answer your questions we have uh, several of them in our church. Rule number four. Start to learn and follow the basic financial principles. You say, what are the basic financial principles? I'm telling you, they're so simple. Example, do you have a budget? No. Get a budget. Start with a budget. They're very, very easy to do. Number two, eliminate needless spending. 
If you just eliminate needless spending, you will probably solve a bunch of your problems. But just basic financial principles. And here's something else I include in rule number four. Be content with what you have. Learn to be content with what you have. Say, why? Why is that important? Because the devil uses discontentment. The devil uses discontentment to lead us to make many foolish financial decisions. Oh, I make $25 an hour, but that man over there makes $26 an hour. I'm going to quit my company and go and work with his company. Now, is that what God is wanting you to do? Because maybe God knows that six months down the road, that company is going bankrupt. And this company will fill your position and you won't be able to get that job back. So you better check it out with God first. Rule number five. And I think this is very important. And it affects a lot of us. We're in too much a hurry. We break our arm. We want it fixed instantly. Don't be in a big panic to fix your financial brokenness. Now I'm not saying don't fix it. I'm saying don't be in a big panic to fix it overnight. Because it's not going to get fixed overnight. Don't be... Don't... Don't let the devil rob you of a good night's sleep. If you're in a big panic to get your finances fixed, you'll toss and turn. You won't be able to sleep. That'll make you a zombie the next day. But more than that, if you're in a big panic, the devil's going to say, well, I know how you can fix your finances overnight. Buy a lotto ticket. And you're going to justify it and say, well, it's only one ticket. I mean, it's only a dollar, two dollar, five dollar, ten dollar, whatever it is. It's only one ticket. It's only one ticket today. But then the devil's going to tell you, you know, if you were to buy two tickets, you're going to double your chances. That makes sense. And now you've thrown away four dollars or ten dollars or twenty dollars. And the devil's going to say to you, you know what? If two is good, three is better. Now you're going to buy yourself three tickets. Don't buy lotto tickets. Because you know what you're saying? You're saying to God, thanks, but I don't need you. If I win this, you know, my problems are over. That's what you're telling God. Imagine, parents, if your children won a million dollars on a lotto and then turned to you and said, well, thanks for everything, but I'm leaving now. What would you think? I know legally they'd have a problem doing that, but... What would you even think that your child would say such a thing to you? What would that tell you about the heart of your child? Wow. Are you a child of God today? Don't play the lotto. Don't get involved with the lotto. You're going to throw, God's giving you good money and you're going to take it and give it to the devil. You're going to throw it away. Don't do that. That's a foolish decision. The prodigal son would have done that. Don't you make that mistake. Okay, we've got to close things up here. Folks, I've spoken on the subject, how to go broke and how to fix it. And now you know everything. You know what makes us go broke, foolish financial decisions, and sometimes the hand of Almighty God. And you now know how to fix or prevent from going broke. And rule number one, without looking at it, is what? Put God first. Put God first in your life. You will never be sorry you did that. If you get to heaven and you haven't put God first, you're going to regret. Put God first. Put God first. Put God first today. If you have financial troubles, that's okay. Join the club. But don't leave it that way. Start to get it fixed. Put God first. Start following the, the rules, the principles of success. You can do that. You will never go wrong because God will meet your needs if I tithe, what will happen to me? God's going to meet your needs is what he's going to do. God will start to bless you. You say, how will he bless me? Any way he wants to. But he'll bless you in good ways. He is going to provide for you financially and you will get out of debt. You will get your brokenness fixed if you'll do it God's way. I want to encourage you to talk to the Lord about this today. Don't, don't say, well, that was a good sermon and... We'll set that on the shelf, you know, for one. Talk to God today about it and about your situation. Even if your situation is not that bad, do you think it could be better? 
Talk to God about it. Maybe God's looking for a financial partner. Maybe he'll partner up with you and start pouring some money through you as a channel so that you can now help support more missionaries and see greater things happen. Talk to God about your financial position today. If you're here today and you're just not sure what's going to happen to you after you die, the thoughts of death are kind of scary. Will I get to heaven? What's going to happen to me? You need to talk to God about that. I can't save you. I can't even save myself. Only Jesus can save you from going to hell. And he's happy and willing and wanting to do that. If you will admit to him the sin that's in your life, you'll just come clean and be honest with God and say, I've blown it. There's sin in my life. I may not have actually pulled the trigger and killed someone, but I've had thoughts and words and I've broken promises and Lord, I've, I've blown it. Jesus, would you forgive my sins? Come into my heart. And he can do that because he's God. God can be in many places all at the same time. He came into my heart on April the 6th, 1975. That's 48 and a half years ago. He's never left me. He can come into your heart today if you'll open your heart's door and say, Jesus, I want you. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. It's up to you. And it's up to you about your finances too. Will you come to God today with your financial situation? Would you stand to your feet, please? Let's have a word of prayer together. Let's pray and let's seek the Lord today. And I encourage you, come and talk to God about your situation. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Our Heavenly Father. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.